Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, let's start our first meeting in person uh, this year to talk about forecasts, uh, expectations for this year. And I guess uh, that uh, this is really very topical uh, because we are all discussing different things. And I think that it is a very good idea to convene in order to uh, get sentiments from the first uh, from the first hand. So I would like immediately to invite to the podium a list of our speakers: uh, Tomas Fiala, uh, Dragon Capital; uh, Tiberio Duma, uh, General Manager of BSF and President of European Business Association; and then uh, Sergei Shakalov, uh, actually owner and General Director of CNES Group; Volodymyr Avramenko, a shareholder, uh, owner and General Director of AVK Confectionery, Oleg Nikonorov, General Director of Regional Gas Company, and Oleksandr Kardakov, uh, Head of the Supervisory Board, Octava Capital. Uh, <clears throat> uh, while you are, getting, you, you are taking your seats, uh, I would like to say that we have online ambassador John Herbst, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, senior director to the Atlantic Council's, Council's Eurasia Center. Uh, John... John, good afternoon, though in your case it's good morning most likely. <laughs> so we would like to talk with you with regards to the uh, forecasts and prognosis uh, of the situation in geopolitics. Because everybody understands that nowadays uh, this particular topic impacts severely the situation in the whole world, especially in Ukraine. And it is very interesting to get your sentiments and your insights on uh, what do you think is going to happen? And how long do you think uh, this situation is going to stay? Is it going to be over this year? Do you think that we might actually uh, have some, I don't know, worsening of the situation or it will stay as it is? So basically you are welcome to share your insight. Okay, um, thank you very much and it's great to be with you even virtually. So good afternoon to all. Uh, I think the most, I think the starting point for this conversation is the effort by uh, Vladimir Putin to force Ukraine to change its national security policy. This is what he's been doing with the war on Ukraine since 2014. Um, he sees Crimea, which actually from the standpoint of forcing Ukraine to change its policy was a mistake because the largest percentage of Ukrainian citizens sympathetic to Moscow live in Crimea. So in that sense, it was kind of stupid. But he's, he has not understood Ukraine very well. And then he began his war in Donbass. But the reason why he's threatening now a major new invasion is that his war in Donbass is a failure. This is something that's not well understood uh, in the West. If the war in Donbass was successful, and again, this war has been going on now for almost eight years. It started of uh, spring of 2014. If this war was successful, Ukraine would be in the process of reorienting its foreign policy towards Moscow and away from Europe. But of course, Ukraine has not done that. So that's why Putin has to threaten a major, major invasion. And so he's been doing that. And he did it in the springtime. And the Biden administration response in the spring was pretty good. You know, they, well, they had every senior American national security official call their Ukrainian counterparts to express support. Um, they had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley. He called not only Kiev, he called Moscow. He spoke with Gerasim to tell him that our response in support of Ukraine was going to be strong. And Moscow stood down. But at the same time, and this is unfortunate, the administration wanting to establish a quote unquote stable and predictable relationship with Moscow, immediately reached out, even as it threatened major actions against a Russian invasion of Ukraine or a new invasion of Ukraine. They reached out to begin a diplomatic dialogue between first Jake Sullivan and Patrushev, which led to the Geneva summit, which was kind of like a, a gift to Moscow. And Moscow, I think, interpreted that as weakness. And Moscow then tested the Biden administration with numerous cyber attacks on the United States, and Biden's response was weak. Uh, finally, at the Geneva summit, Biden issued a stern warning 
on further cyber attacks, which the Russians ignored. So the Russians watching the administration respond on cyber drew the conclusion that it was weak, which is, again, unfortunate. So in the fall, Moscow once again began the buildup of its forces on your border. But the administration surprised the Kremlin, at least partly, because the response now in this crisis has been stronger than the response in the crisis last spring. Biden made clear that three major things would happen if Moscow were to send this new force, this large force into Ukraine. One, we would send more arms to Ukraine. Two, we would put more NATO forces alongside Russia's border among the Eastern members of NATO. And three, we would levy devastating sanctions on the Kremlin in that case. Sanctions far more powerful than the ones we put imposed since their war in Donbass began in 2014. Uh, we've now reached a standoff. Uh, Russia continues to put more forces on Ukraine's border, not just in Russia itself, but in the Black Sea, and also, of course, in Belarus. And a major military exercise will take place in Belarus in coming weeks. Uh, Moscow has spoken very, very belligerently, saying that they have these demands, and these demands were put in these two draft treaties that the Russians sent to us, the United States, and to NATO in late December. Uh, these demands include, most importantly, uh, an end to NATO's open door, not just for Ukraine and Georgia, but also for Finland and Sweden. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and these so-called treaties demand that all NATO forces currently in countries that were not members of NATO before 1995 must be removed. So essentially we must uh, remove NATO forces, NATO equipment from all the NATO members that were either once part of the Soviet Union or once part of the Warsaw Pact. In other words, we should render these nations defenseless. These are obviously unacceptable demands. But Moscow said when they sent those treaties forward that unless our demands are met, um, we will use, as they, this is a very strange phrase, military technical means in Ukraine. But you know, it's funny. We, they sent us those treaties. We had these round, this, the rounds of, uh, three rounds of talks the week of January 10, 11. There was a NATO Russia talk, there was a US Russia talk, and then there were talks in the OSCE. And Moscow did not get any of the demands that it made. Uh, but instead of simply saying, okay, we're not getting what we want, and now we have to move to our military technical response, Moscow wanted to continue talking to the United States. So the week after those three rounds of talks, Lavrov went to Geneva to see Blinken. But Lavrov demanded, the Russians demanded, that we respond in writing to those two draft treaties. So we did that about three weeks ago. And the texts of the American and the NATO responses, I believe, have become public. And they essentially reject all the um, outrageous demands made by Moscow, although they also talk about certain things we might be able to do in security and to ease tensions more broadly. Uh, but once again, Moscow's demands were rejected. Yet Lavrov somehow found, to use his words, a kernel of rationality in the Western response. To me, this underscores something that's very important. This underscores that Moscow really does not want to launch a major counter, a major offensive against Ukraine. I believe the Kremlin is deeply worried about the response that Biden has laid out. Uh, he's worried about big new sanctions. He's worried about an increase in NATO forces uh, in the East. 
Now, there are many people, many smart people, who argue that things are set up in such a way that Putin has to launch some new attack on Ukraine. Uh, I've already explained to you, actually, I've, I've given you most of the reasons why I don't think Putin will do that, but let me add two more. First, there is no doubt in my mind that while the Ukrainian military cannot defeat the Russians, they will impose serious costs on invading Russian forces. In other words, there'll be lots of dead Russian soldiers, and that's a liability for Putin. It's also true that the Russians can probably seize any territory in Ukraine that they want, but they will not be able to hold it without major casualties. There will be a Partizanskaya Vaina, and I should say in Ukrainian, Partizanskaya Vina. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You see, everybody applauses you. Uh, so it's really dangerous for Putin because his own public does not want it. I, I imagine at least some of you, um, like me, have learned a new Russian name in the last few days, Colonel General Ivashev, um, a retired Colonel General, Russian Colonel General, head of a Russian um, officers association, who is known as a, straw, a staunch Russian patriot, a hardliner, and he, sent, he issued a statement for Putin saying it would be a disaster for Russia to invade Ukraine. NATO and Ukraine do not pose a threat to Russia. What does pose a threat to Russia are the internal policies of the Putin regime. Now that's analysis, that, she, that, that, that is my analysis of Russia, coming from the mouth of a patriotic Russian general. So far, nothing has happened to, to Colonel General Yavasha, which is also very interesting. His statement came out two or three days ago. And there is ample polling data uh, from the Levada Center, Russia's premier uh, polling center, suggesting that the Russian people want no part of a war with Ukraine. And by the way, there was an excellent article, and it was either foreign affairs or foreign policy on the last couple of days by a gentleman named Kolesnikov, which provides all this data. So for all these reasons, I don't think Putin is actually going to launch, certainly not a major offensive, and probably not even a quote-unquote minor incursion. Uh, but let, let, me, let me talk a little bit about the uh, nuances of American policy. I've already partly talked about that when I referred to the Geneva summit and Russian cyber operations against the United States. But you see these nuances in the Biden team's handling of the current Russian buildup. Now, I give them good marks, solid marks, for the policy that they have outlined, which I've already described to you, the three, the three types of steps that the US will take if Moscow invades. But those steps could be better. And in fact, uh, I helped organize a group of former officials to lay this out at the end of December. If we really want to deter the Russians from launching a new invasion of Ukraine, we should be sending the arms to Ukraine now. And we should be sending advanced weaponry. If we really want to deter the invasion, a new invasion, we should be putting NATO forces in the East now. The Biden administration only began to do those two things within the last two weeks. That's, I mean, I praise them for having done it, but it's a little bit late. And even now, on the weapons side, it's a little bit weak. We know that the administration was making it harder for our NATO allies to send stingers to Ukraine. That has now stopped. They, the administration is no longer doing that. We also know that the administration about two weeks ago began to send additional arms to Ukraine. Again, that's a good thing, but we are not sending many of our own stingers. And our stingers are much more sophisticated than the stingers um, that the, our allies have. And that's because I think the administration is still a little bit wary about annoying Moscow. And that's a serious mistake. That hesitation is a mistake. So while the overall response has been good, it could be better. And the stronger, the better the response, the less likely Moscow is willing to actually launch a new attack. Uh, there's also uh, 
the matter of the difference in the way the United States and Ukraine talk about the Russian threat. This has gotten a great deal of press attention over the past couple of weeks. Uh, the basics are that the administration here has been speaking in very stark terms about a likely Russian invasion, and the administration in Kyiv has been saying that they're, yes, Ukraine must prepare for such an invasion, but they're not sure it's imminent and they're not sure it's likely. And of course, you even had some uh, public differences specifically mentioned, some public criticism from one side to the other in this period. Now that public criticism is unfortunate, but we should understand why the two sides have different evaluations. On the American side, uh, they hope by uh, speaking in very loud language about this, to one, avoid the repeat of the disaster of Afghanistan, where the administration was seen to be speaking in very optimistic terms about what would happen, and then being embarrassed when the whole country came down, came crashing down in a matter of a week or two. Secondly, the administration is properly concerned that some of our European allies and partners are weak need when it comes to dealing with Kremlin aggression. So they want to talk in a, in a loud voice about the possibility in order to encourage them to do the right thing in terms of sanctions on Moscow. Uh, and then three, there's always the possibility that the administration believes what it's saying, and I think we should not discount that. And so, and obviously from a geopolitical point of view, it would be a disaster, not just for Ukraine, but for the West, for the United States, if Moscow were to launch a new offensive. So I think that explains the administration's position. As for Bankova's position, uh, that comes from the fact that one, they, pro they do, I think, read the intelligence differently than Washington. They think that the likelihood of uh, an invasion is less than the administration does. And as I think you already understand from what I've said, uh, my view is closer to Bankova's than it is to the White House. Although, again, I credit the White House is solid, but not very best response to Moscow's provocation as one of the reasons why we will not see Russia launch a new offensive. But then too, Zelensky's worried about his population, their attitude, and he wants to keep them calm. And three, perhaps even more important than that, Zelensky's worried about the Ukrainian economy. The threat of a new invasion has been very bad for the Hrivna, and the Ukrainian government has to spend a lot of money defending the currency. And this is, this is something the administration, I think, now understands, the U.S. administration. And I believe they're working on an economic aid package to help deal with that, which is a good thing. Last point, last point. Uh, the White House has also been unhappy about Bankova's readiness to reach out to the U.S. Congress in support of, I would say, vital interests of Ukraine on both Nord Stream 2 and weapons to Ukraine. Uh, I know that it's a little bit unusual for friendly governments to do that, but frankly, I think Zelensky was right. Uh, I think most of your audience knows that I'm a sharp critic of the administration's very weak Nord Stream 2 policy. The waiving of sanctions in May was a disaster, uh, but I, will, I don't need to go into that now. And the only way that Ukraine retained a chance that the U.S. would reverse his position is Zelensky reached out to Congress. So he did the smart thing. And it's worth noting that this is not the first time a Ukrainian president did something like that. Because Poroshenko reached out to Congress in September of 2014 asking for more arms because the Obama administration was shame, shamefully refusing to send any weapons. And I know the Obama administration was unhappy about that. But Poroshenko did the right thing for Ukraine, but also for the United States. And of course, Zelensky's done the same thing with Congress on arms to Ukraine now. And I've already explained to you that the administration has been slow and weak in providing additional arms to Ukraine. So there too, Zelensky's intervention with Congress was not just for Ukraine's interests, but also for American interests in the face of, let's say, one of the inadequacies of the Biden policy towards Russia and Ukraine. So that's basically the, the situation. 
Uh, but if you want to ask questions, if that's yeah. possible, I'm happy to answer. If not, I'm happy yeah. to. But you go down to the real business of your conference. But uh, I would like to uh, ask a few questions. Uh, of course, uh, thank you very much for your encouraging um, political overview. And it's good that actually, at least you do not expect that something th serious is going to happen. But when it comes to um, economy, not only Zelensky is being concerned about the economy, because here we are having around um, even more than 300 CEOs of members companies and they are also very much concerned about the economy in case this uh, tension would be kept in place. Uh, so that's why uh, of course support of US uh, would be very helpful in this regard. But do you think that it's going to, to be somehow releasing this year, I mean the tension itself or not? And what do you suggest to the business people? And by the way, the, the question which is connected uh, to the previous ones, do you believe that US companies are going to invest in Ukraine in the current situation? Okay. Uh, I have some bad news for you here. Well, actually, it's not news. I, I have analysis, which is you're not going to welcome. Uh, it's very, I'm very sad to say that Putin pays no price for the provocation of threatening a major new offensive. Actually, he pays a certain price. There is a certain cost to, uh, in terms of rubles and the preparedness of the Russian military. But that's a relatively minor price to pay for the economic damage that the mere threat of a Russian new invasion has in Ukraine. And uh, my, so my sense is Putin understands that he will get smacked very hard if he sends those troops into Ukraine. So he probably won't. But right now he pays no price for the threat beyond what I've, what I've mentioned. And I, I know there are people in Congress who want to sanction Moscow for this intimidation. <clears throat> I don't know if the administration is willing to do that. And that would be, again, another weakness of the administration. But this is something that I'll be working on. Assuming there is no invasion, that's, that's the next thing that I'll be working on um, you know, putting out arguments, making, uh, doing advocacy for a policy that imposes a cost on the Kremlin for provocation as opposed to new aggression. So from, that, from, from the standpoint of this analysis, it would make sense for Putin either just to keep those forces there, you know, for the indefinite future, or to demobilize for a few months and then remobilize again come, I don't know, August, September, October, whatever. So unless you, the West has gotten stronger and smarter in dealing with Kremlin aggression, it now has to get stronger and smarter in dealing with Kremlin provocation. But we haven't gotten there yet. So let's learn. So thank you so much, John, for, for your insights. And I would like to uh, probably thank you and wish you a great day. And we will continue with our conversation. Uh, thank you. And I would like to invite also Uh, to the podium, uh, an exclusive partner of the event, the Global Outlook, Alexander Pissarou, Kreifeisen Bank. <laughs> uh, look, uh, I would like to, uh, to ask the first question to Tiberio. Uh, yesterday we had a meeting with the President of Ukraine, and uh, how do you evaluate that meeting? Do you feel that he has sent enough good signals uh, to you as a businessman? Uh, as a leader of the company, and uh, do you feel that uh, we are in the safe situation? Uh, I mean, here currently in Ukraine, and afterwards, I will tell you, I will ask you about the situation in your company. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anna, for the question. Uh, thank you, Raiffeisen Bank, for sponsoring this event. It's very important to have such a partner next to EBA. Uh, regarding to the meeting yesterday, look, it's not only my opinion. We uh, debated. We. Uh, uh, you know, debriefed after the meeting together with some colleagues from the EBA board. Um, we had a very good impression, and I will tell you a few uh, arguments why. First of all, we had a very strong feeling that the president and its staff was very well prepared. They are on top of the thing, they are dealing with the situation very professionally, they put the right resources into place, and they covered with all arguments all the aspects of security concerns, financial market concerns, uh, measures to stimulate the economy into the, these difficult times, be, and beyond the conflict, also uh, beyond the COVID, 
and uh, really looking like it to a normal uh, economy. Um, also, we felt the, the, the way we addressed our current topics, you know, talking about IP, uh, intellectual property or uh, shadow economy or tax burden or so, uh, energy prices, uh, they capture more of the points. They were asking meaningful questions. Recording stopped. Okay. <laughs> off the record. This is now off the record. Now it's time to talk. <laughs> now I can talk freely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, overall, we got the, a real impression of a dialogue, not of a monologue. Yeah? Exactly. Uh, we got very good confidence that the, uh, the situation is, uh, is managed in the best possible way, this, uh, this uh, geopolitical uh, situation. Yeah? Uh, and um, yeah, I think we have a, a joint agreement together with the, at least within the board members that this is the, the conclusion. Yeah, it was just a very good you, meeting. Yeah. yeah, just for you to know, I, I just deliberately raised this point in order to inform the whole community that yesterday there was a number of 28, 29 persons attending that meeting and it was also done in order to uh, have the scenario circle in order to talk in more details on this on a particular topic. And uh, I can only support the words of Tiberio and I can only add that also Rastislav Sharva is also a pretty good guy and it's good that economic block is in very nice, uh, in very nice hands. So let's see, uh, let's hope that uh, industrial dialects uh, which should be following up uh, will continue. Uh, <laughs> as a president of the EBA, what kind of messages do you like to send uh, to the business community? What kind of forecast do you see uh, in front of us? Yeah, uh, first of all, um, I think the, um, the colleague before mentioned something about, uh, you know, uh, we are concerned about how the economy is doing and so on. I think one thing we need to uh, make ourselves conscious, people in this room here, I, will, I, I just counted we are more than 300 people here, most of us uh, CEOs. Uh, I think we are, first of all, we are the economy, yeah? So, of course, we have a lot of external uh, influence, and sometimes this influence can be negative, coming from uh, different angles, but we play a role as well. So it starts with us. So what are we doing, first of all, to, to keep the things running? And also, exchanging with many of my peers, I think, uh, talking now about international uh, companies which are doing business in Ukraine, all of us in the last three, four weeks, were extremely busy calming the spirits in our headquarters, yeah? And this is extremely important because the headquarters can always pull the plug and say, uh, stop shipments, reduce, uh, reduce credits, reduce exposure, it's risky, and so on and so forth. We managed uh, very successfully, and it's not only us, I think it's valid for any international company here, uh, to calm down the spirits and to continue running business as usual with the typical challenges, you know. F for us as a company, uh, and I'm very proud to say that, this, is, uh, this was the best January ever, yeah? And uh, there were, of course, many questions. Should we reduce a little bit the exposure? Uh, we are crediting a lot of, you know, our customers. Um, and we did not do any uh, dramatic, any you know, it, uh, yeah, uh, measure which should uh, damage our, uh, you know, business footprint or so on. So, and we made it also very clear to, to the president as well that all the international business community is super committed to running the business in Ukraine, to take care about employees and customers, even in difficult situations. Uh, we are here to support also, and most importantly, we are also very willing and here to support with the, with the reforms. Yeah. And do you think that you're going to in continue investing in this country as you already started actually in January? And uh, when it comes to this growth and financial results, is it in evenly distributed between different sectors? Because you are actually working in different sectors. Uh, where the situation looks the best, according to your point of view? We started very strong across all the industries, but particularly stronger in agriculture. Uh, there are also some, um, uh, how should I say, uh, some elements there of influence from the previous years, like lower channel inventory, excellent crop year uh, the previous year, but also we see strong demand. Now, strong demand on, on the agriculture, very strong demand. 
Now, of course, there is a little bit of uh, influence in, in times of, um, in difficult times, customers, our type of customers, which is usually other businesses, they tend to uh, uh, a little bit stockpile because if they have cash reserves, they prefer to exchange it into dollarized assets, how we call them, you know. And you have a product which can keep its dollar in, in uh, its value in, in a hard currency. Um, but nevertheless, what is important once again, we also continue with credits, which long-term credits. I mean, we expect to collect the money in, after the harvest, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did not make any any reduction or any, any yeah. We, you know, another we actually, believe things will run normally. Yeah? You see, another type of positive news, eh, because the first one from John, now from Tiberio, this is excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, so uh, any other question where I should uh, I, I think that I should wrap, wrap it up. I think yes. Okay, then <laughs> I think uh, from one, one last thought from my side. Um, if I, I see for this year, I, I hope it's helpful also for all of you, it's nothing new. There are five critical elements to look after this year. It is supply chain, you know, there is continue, uh, con a continued shortage of goods across the world and issues with supply chains, yeah, with trucks, with containers and so on. Many reasons for that. It, it's going to get better, but it's still an issue. Uh, inflation, we don't need, even not need to talk about it, it's very obvious. We will talk with Tomas. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, Climate change efforts, where we have a lot of regulatory dilemmas and big dilemmas for uh, big companies, how to balance the pressure of uh, being profitable and grow with the pressure of uh, having less carbon footprint and less waste. It's an it's a extremely difficult exercise. Uh, and then also in the climate changes, you know, it's going to be wind, solar, nuclear, um, hydrogen uh, is still not clear what is going to be the future. Um, and I think what is very important for all of you here, uh, it's people. Our people, we all together over the last two years with COVID and now particularly in Ukraine with all this uh, tense situation, we are taking a lot of psychological burden. Do not underestimate this. It's extremely important. So make sure you take care about your employees. Yeah, and this is one thing. The second thing: this year, uh, I predict that very soon COVID will be over. At least the restrictions of. COVID we will check next yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think will be, the restrictions will be over in spring. At the already. next reality check, we yeah. will check it. Uh, so with we will, you, we will have to return to normal. Yeah, wow. uh, but. It's not going to be so simple because people are used to work remotely. So make sure you make your policies, don't make it over bureaucratic and uh, keep this into, into effect. Yeah? And last, my last uh, thought is on cybersecurity. Um, we have, there is a lot of progress to combat and to defend on cybersecurity, but still there is, uh, we still have and we will, we will have one big vulnerability, which is the human factor. Yeah? One day you will receive an email which is so genuine that you will click the attachment or the link and that will be the end of your uh, IT system yeah? mm. <laughs> until you pay a ransom. <laughs> so uh, it's, it has an enormous uh, disruption, disruptive potential and it is not only targeted to critical infrastructure, big company governments, it can affect every single one of uh, our companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much Tiberio. Uh, now let's move to macroeconomics. Tomas, and of course, exchange rate <laughs> forecast. Okay, uh, well, um, obviously, uh, everybody's uh, expectations uh, from this year has, uh, have been uh, changed a little bit by uh, the activities of our Russian neighbor, uh, but um, we also assume um, or we have the same prediction as Ambassador uh, Herbst uh, uh, that uh, the current pressure will be limited to hybrid war and will not cross uh, physically um, or the Russian army will not cross physically in, into, into Ukraine uh, but they will continue uh, to exercise, uh, uh, exercise pressure. Uh, so far, it has had impact uh, on uh, the currency uh, from the peak in approximately uh, October, November. Uh, the currency until the middle of uh, January depreciated, uh, lost only about 10% of its value, 
which is better than uh, March 2020 uh, during uh, during the start of COVID, uh, when uh, Grivna lost about 13%, um, and the central bank had to support it with about $2 billion uh, from its reserves. Uh, now the central bank has spent uh, roughly $1.5 billion in January, and since then it has bought back about half a billion dollars, and you see the Grivna uh, appreciating. So uh, the worst uh, from this uh, uh, panic uh, uh, happened about two, two, three weeks ago, and it's over. Mm, uh, the same can be said about the prices for Ukrainian euro bonds. Uh, they have declined over the last three months uh, by about 20, 20 points, uh, quite significant. Mm, but uh, since then, they have uh, recovered about one quarter uh, of, of those losses. Uh, so again, the worst uh, seems to be over there. No substantial panic. I guess um, uh, Alexander will speak about the banking sector, uh, which is uh, also going through this period uh, very well. So uh, let's say security, uh, we think more of the same. Uh, macroeconomics, uh, we think uh, relatively stable. Um, there are two external factors that one has to pay attention to. That's uh, prices of energy and in particular gas. And Ukraine will have to import more gas uh, this year than it did uh, last year when we started the year with uh, record high reserves. Uh, and uh, the second thing is uh, inflation. Uh, you maybe saw just today uh, inflation figures uh, for January in the United States, 7.5%, uh, the highest inflation uh, since 82. Um, Eurozone 5.1% uh, January to January, so very high inflation worldwide, uh, which leads to rate increases uh, by key central banks. There have been already over 100 rate increases uh, across the world in recent months, and they will continue throughout this year. Um, the United States will probably raise uh, four times, maybe even five times. Uh, ECB uh, will have to raise rates uh, one or two times, uh, maybe more this year. Uh, what uh, here it's quite important um, that um, the Central Bank of Ukraine has started already last year and last year raised uh, rates by 300 basis points and again this year by 100 basis points because what this higher inflation and higher rates in the world mean is that money leaves emerging markets like uh, Ukraine and the cost of money uh, goes up. So here we need in Ukraine conservative uh, monetary and fiscal policy. We have communicated yesterday to the president uh, that he should not be upset at the central bank for increasing rates, uh, even though it runs against his goals of uh, um, cheap uh, mortgages and, and, and so on. Uh, these loans will have to be subsidized uh, from the budget as they have done it before if they want to um, uh, stimulate the economy uh, this way, which you know, I think has limited impact, but uh, let it be. Um, <clears throat> it would be much better to do structural reforms uh, instead of these uh, short-term fixes. Um, and uh, the fiscal policy will also need to be conservative because it will be, we don't have access to the external market. Ukraine needs to raise this year eight and a half billion dollars from external uh, sources, six billion to cover our budget deficit, two and a half billion to cover uh, maturing uh, liabilities. And without market access, we have only IMF, EU, United States, World Bank, and a few other countries uh, that can uh, And shadow us. economy. And shadow economy, yeah? Well, uh, yeah, one can also uh, real, uh, increase budget revenues, which uh, actually uh, budget revenues last year have exceeded uh, original plans uh, quite substantially. And so far this year, they are also exceeding the plans. Part of it might be uh, better work of tax authorities and customs authorities, but uh, I think uh, the most substantial uh, reason for that is uh, very high inflation. You have uh, CPI 10%, uh, PPI 60% uh, for last year, and the budget, uh, the, the GDP deflator, it wasn't reported yet for the full year, but it will be probably around 25% in the first three quarters. It was, it was roughly... 25%, uh, which led to, the, to GDP growing from about $153 billion last year to about $200 billion uh, last year. It was mainly very high uh, inflation, which has also boosted uh, budget revenues uh, and gives the government a lot of flexibility. It's, it's very good that it has this flexibility, but it will probably not be able 
uh, to continue. Uh, in last year, uh, the parliament has re revised the budget expenditures several times, increased them, uh, boosted mainly the spending for, for roads and infrastructure. Um, it may not be so easy to, to do that this year. Uh, it may be forced to cut the budget deficit this year. So, you know, uh, we expect GDP to grow around 3% this year. Uh, we are not changing that forecast. Uh, the currency uh, will be probably stable in the first half of this year. Uh, we had great harvest uh, and that will continue to be exported. It's, uh, if you see at the uh, year over year, uh, pace of um, uh, soft commodity exports from Ukraine, uh, it's substantially higher. Uh, um, and, and the prices are also very high, steel iron ore prices also going up again. Um, so we have pretty good situation in the first half. The second half will be probably tougher because we'll have to import uh, almost 10 billion cubic meters of uh, gas and the prices are currently around $900 and if you look at the forward curve uh, to year end, they stay about $500 for the rest of this year. Um, so that's a lot of money that we'll have to spend. Um, so we think the currency may devalue into the, uh, towards 29, 30, towards the year end, but uh, throughout the year it, it will be probably stronger, stronger than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because everybody is actually expecting your forecast. So you are like Vanga, <laughs> everybody, <laughs> then checking and planning their <laughs> budgets. Thank you. But do you think that you will, you in, currently, do you continue investing? in your new project? We actually do, yeah. We are continuing investing in all our old projects, uh, continue to build our industrial uh, parks in Lviv and uh, Kiev. Uh, we actually are in the process of uh, several M&A deals right now. Um, I mean, it's... So, yeah. But you're looking we, good prices, right? So basically devalued or re reduced prices or not? Well, prices haven't haven't come that they don't react that fast. Uh, uh, yeah, you could buy cheap euro bonds uh, in January and, and and make some money on that. Uh, but you know, kind of hard assets, they have not really uh, the prices haven't really changed uh, substantially. Yeah. Well, th there is probably one deal that we are doing where where the price has reduced in the last two months. Um, so we, we are also we are obviously being very careful and uh, keeping uh, powder dry uh, <laughs> just in case. But uh, uh, we are moving ahead on several uh, several M and A transactions. Cool. Thank you. Now let's switch to banking. Uh, to Alexander, how do you see the future of banking system in Ukraine this year? Thank you, uh, Anna. Well, let's recap on the macroeconomics, and I guess it's always easy to speak after Tomas. I do it on every other panel. And when he's so detailed, I just need to recap what he said. Um, <laughs> just to remember, the global economy is slowing, the growth is slowing, but inflation is rising. So the slower growth and high inflation, and high interest rates is a global phenomenon. The same here in Ukraine, no difference. The real GDP will be, growth will be slower this year, Inflation higher, interest rates higher, and for longer. That's what you know already, Tomas said it. I mean, the NBU has forecast that they will have to probably raise more key rates this year, and probably they will. And we'll keep higher rates for longer and then go down to a target interest rate corridor, which is 5% plus minus 1%. They say before mid-2023, I think probably it will take a little longer. Maybe end of next year or beginning of 2000. 24, but basically that's the environment we're in. I think one important comment to make on, the mark, on monetary policy that in Ukraine, besides the inflation CPI and there's a major inflation targeting, uh, sort of uh, inflation, tar inflation is a target essentially of the monetary regime, there is a bit of a financial stability component in the, in the key rate decisions. So once the geopolitical risks rise, they need to raise rates higher. That's always been the case, and remember, that's just to justify what they did is the right thing. Um, but that's basically it. So it means that um, banking systems, if we go back to banking system, acts in, the, in this macro environment. Banking system is in the, probably in best shape in years. I said the same when the COVID started. It remains the same. The COVID did not have a major impact on the banking sector, probably uh, because it, 
the major cleanup of the banking sector was done some years back, and that the strength of the sector keeps until this day. We survived well COVID crisis. We, we actually will survive well these temporary geopolitical tensions. But in the end, we need to understand that the growth is slowing, so will be the credit growth slowing. So it's, there's a normal correlation between um, the uh, real economic growth and the credit growth. Last year, just to give you an example, the economy grew by sort of 3.7 something percent, 3.2, it depends on how you calculate the final number. But the, the credit growth was really high double digits. So in Raiffeisen, we are a conservative foreign bank, the largest foreign bank, the, the, the performing loan portfolio increased by 51%. 51. So the credit grows were very fast. It will slow. The credit is still available. I mean, banking sector has a lot of capital. It's over liquid, but demand for credit will slow. So will the credit. So and the, basically, and the cost for the loan. The cost for the loans reflect the monetary policy decision. The cost of, of loans is basically a cost of funding, which is linked to the key rate of the central bank plus the credit margin, which reflects the risks of a country and the individual borrower. That's simple as this. So the interest rates will be higher this year and probably for a part of next year, then we'll continue going down. With the important comment, the interest rates actually this year have not increased much. The central bank increased uh, key rate already a few times. But the banking system, because it's overlooked, did not raise rate until late. Only recently, the interest rates and loans started going up. It will continue for a while, but then it will stabilize, and then next year it will start going down again. This is my forecast um, on the market situation, just back to what Thomas said. Well, I, Thomas, you mentioned panic. There was no panic here whatsoever. What the panic was is in the Ukrainian eurobond market with the foreign investors selling eurobonds, and then now they're buying them back good time to make money. On the local foreign exchange market, what I saw was actually pressure. And pressure is no panic. I have not seen panic. And I, you know, my experience, I've seen panic, true panic. In well, 2014, well, 14, 15, uh -huh. there was nothing nearly similar or even resembling that. Actually, if you think of deposit outflows that the banking sector had and, and, and affects market pressures, they were much, much uh, smaller than, for example, when the COVID started. In the beginning of the COVID wave 2020, there was a lot more pressure on the FX market and there was higher deposit offer. Nothing happened this time until now. So there is no panic, Tomas. There will not be panic, I'm pretty sure. So everything is stable. So life is, in this respect, very, very stable, yes. Life goes on. Life goes on, yes. <laughs> But uh, also you're a member of the board of the EBA and I would like to ask you um, one question which is connected to leadership. Do you believe uh, what kind of role should be of the leader in the current circumstances? Is it important to be a strong leader and what kind of characteristic uh, we should actually keep in ourselves in order to be successful? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, well, I think it's always important to be a strong leader, but uh, it's never more important than in a crisis situation or a situation which is a perceived crisis, or information crisis. When people start being shaky or fearsome or worried, you need to be strong and you need to be confident. What is important in terms of quality is you need to be calm. You need to rationally analyze the information and filter out the noise. And there's so much media noise, especially in the West, which is, I think, part of the tactics to park this crisis to rest. And, but we need to filter this through and look through it. And that's what the leader needs to do. The second thing what uh, he needs to do, he needs to be uh, realistically optimistic, I would call it this way, with clients, with staff, and importantly, as Tiberio uh, Dima explained, with the shareholders. It's foreign shareholders who are particularly nervous these days because the media noise is stronger there. We all, as Tiberio said, are working every day with our shareholders. We are lucky with our shareholders. They, they listen and, and nobody is actually too worried. But this is very important. And the last but not the least, I think, uh, talking to the teams, talking to the people, spreading the positive message, reassuring the teams, reassuring the clients. Again, projecting positive realism, but doing this regularly in communication. This is very important. Thank you. Good, actually, insights and good instructions to ourselves to follow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to ask, um, actually, Aveka Volodymyr, uh, what kind of situation you have in your company, and do you feel that anxiety, which is in the air, helps to eat more sweets? <laughs> Does it impact your business positively? Uh, thank you. Uh, um, I'm sorry uh, for me, but uh, to speak uh, Ukrainian. Uh, You're welcome. That's why I will use uh, our. Uh, Ukrainian language uh, are more comfortable because uh, it's uh, very important for me because uh, I need to uh, transform uh, my idea to you more clearly as in English. I'm sorry. Без проблем, давайте. Тому я хочу сказати, що стосовно поточної ситуації в Україні. і ваші прогнози на майбутнє. Стосовно поточної ситуації на Україні, то я теж дуже підтримую те, що сказали мої попередники. Я не розумію, як ми будемо тут жити в цій країні, якщо ми будемо панікувати і думати, що краще сидіти на валізах. Тому для нас це всіх визов, і ми повинні зрозуміти, що ніхто нас не буде готувати, а ми повинні самі будувати своє майбутнє. І це виклик для кожної компанії, для великої, для маленької. І дуже я вдячний, що є іноземні інвестори, які вірять в цю країну і вкладають великі гроші, допомагають не тільки грошима, але не своєю точкою зору. І це дуже важливо для нас. Тому я хочу подякувати за це. Подяка, власне, і їм, і вам, тому що якби більшість в залі – це саме іноземний бізнес. Тому, тому да, дійсно, якщо ми будемо казати, що ми тут тільки українці маємося реальною економікою, то це буде тяжко, це, це буде нереально, це не буде неможливо. Коли ми бачимо підтримку із-за кордону і розуміємо, що було раніше, де ми сьогодні, і можемо моделювати ситуацію на майбутнє. Тому наша Україна – це кожен із нас, і неважливо, це ти ФОПом працюєш тут, чи керівником великої компанії. Ми всі – це майбутнє України. Ну, я в цій країні 30 років, навіть більше, як займаюся бізнесом, і хочу сказати, що ми пройшли через різні іспити, і це не перша криза. Але, знаєте, часто кажуть так, українською кажуть, не тратьте куми сили, спускайтеся на дно. Тому оце, не знаю, як це перекласти на англійську, але як, кум, як буде англійською кум, не знаю, як це буде. Але я кажу, що, знаєте, коли у людини бувають кризи, неважливо, це в сім'ї, особисті кризи чи в компанії, то є різні виклики. Якщо людина не розуміє, що далі робити, то вона дійсно може так спускатися на дно. І так часто буває, але якщо трохи напружитись або достатньо напружитись, то вихід завжди буде. Він складний, він тяжкий, він не гарантує, в житті нічого на 100% не гарантує, але треба туди йти. І коли кажемо про сьогодні ситуацію, то моя компанія АВК – Confectionary в кращої ситуації, тому що у нас ця криза почалася в 2014 році. І можна було тоді зробити те, що я казав раніше в прислів'ї, але ми працювали ретельно і зараз працюємо, виплачуємо заробітну платню, платимо податки, робимо експорт, збудували нове виробництво і впевнено дивимось вперед. Тому, знаєте, дуже важливо це відчувати. І якщо казати про минулий рік, 21 рік, то хочу сказати, що да, у нас, як у іншої компанії, були такі плани там, і фінансові показники. Чи вдались вони? В тому обсягі, якому дивились, вони не вдались. Декілька причин. Ну, по-перше, коронавірус продовжувався. По-друге, логістика зросла не тільки в грошовому вигляді, але і з точки зору чи, таймінгу вдвічі, втричі, якщо ми маємо необхідність експортувати продукцію, імпортувати продукцію з усього світу. І третє – це енергоносії, які теж дуже різко вдарили. Тому, да, ми не отримали ті прибутки, які бажали, але ми залишилися прибутковими. Ми збільшили на 10% свою долю на ринку. Ну, головне не це. Головне те, що ми маємо свою стратегію і рухаємося далі. Стратегія виходить в те, що треба розуміти, що Україна – це 
не просто аграрна країна. Я, на жаль, не знаю ні одної країни в світі, яка успішна тільки завдяки аграрному сектору. Це дуже добре, що росте чорноземи, що росте аграрний сектор, але там немає added value. Там воно дуже маленьке, це комодіті. Тому о, моя компанія завжди дивилася на те, щоб будувати щось нове з, з великою доданою вартістю. І незважаючи на кризу, завжди е, люди їли і будуть їсти. Питання тільки що, по якій ціні. І третє, це важливо розуміти, що е, треба не е, дивитися на тренди і підхоплювати їх. Треба будувати тренди. Тому я хочу сказати, що, знаєте, якщо казати про наше суспільство, то, на жаль, я дуже дійсно зінструбований, що рівень культури харчової у нас десь дуже-дуже позаду. Ми всі розуміємо, хорошо в гаджетах, там, в макропоказниках, в автомобілях, але це за мене як харчовика турбує. І... Але Ви, що мало дуже... цукерок, що мало цукерок їдять, Д... да? дуже, добре, добре, дуже, дуже добре розвивається фар... фармацевтика. Це зрозуміло. Якщо щось там не, не yeah. так, то є хто підставить плече і скаже, я от зроблю краще, іди до мене, ось ці пигалка, оце там, і все, все буде нормально. Тому, тому ми не пішли далі, і я не хочу казати про цукерки, тому що три роки тому ми вирішили стати харчовою компанією і почали робити продукти нового покоління. Ну, звісно, що з когось треба брати приклад. Взяли приклад з американських ведучих компаній, які вже роблять конкретно це рослинне м'ясо. Компанії дуже яскраві, вони дуже швидко рухаються вперед. Томаш їх знає, я думаю. Ми не стали чекати і три роки тому почали робити це. І я хочу сказати, що це нове покоління м'яса, там три складові. Перше, це те, що це майбутнє. Друге, те, що це екологічна складова. І третє, етична складова. Ну, поки що я хочу сказати про першу, про економічну, що зараз ми запустили цей продукт, люди зрозуміли, хтось зрозумів, він вже пішов продаватись там в сучасних мережах, можна купити, і ми зараз працюємо над тим, щоб сировину теж виготовляти у нас в країні, а не купати і за кордоном, де ми зараз там, ми зараз у Франції купуємо. Тобто, Тому... я так розумію, це один із трендів і нових, О, які ви формуєте, тобто ну, штучним новий, м'ясом. Новий продукт харчування, вони завжди будуть і ми хочемо, ми бачимо, що зараз вже деякі компанії підхватили цей тренд вони тут починають це робити і я цим пишаюсь але це робота вдовгу А Якщо... українці люблять штучне м'ясо? От як ви це не штучне м'ясо, пробачається не... це... А рослинне, чи як воно? Це рослинне, рослинне, рослинне вибачте, вибачте. Це, це велика різниця ага, А в чому різниця? Різниця в тому, що там все натуральне там натуральний рослинний білок натуральне масло натуральне все натуральне. Штучне це трошки інша тема, давайте ми не давайте. будемо пугати людей. От. І, Бо я ну, думаю, що корівка це якби на, ну, на, справ, на справжнє м'ясо, а ніби то, як рослинне, то теж на натуральне ну, м'ясо. Я, у нас завдання на поточний рік, ми зараз вже зробили значить, велику працю і збудували там обладнання, технології, і будемо самі використовувати українську сировину для того, щоб робити повністю 100% українську рослинне м'ясо. І це буде у нас завдання, щоб воно опустилось по ціні до рівня Яловичини, Добре Яловичини. І ми це зробимо, ви побачите на полицях. І я читаю відгуки. В цьому відгуки. році це буде, да? В цьому мережах вони добрі відгуки. Тобто в цьому році, а ви їсте вже рослинне м'ясо? Обов'язково, обов'язково. Тому о, ви все, все, Томаш? ми до цього прийдемо. Якщо дивитися на тренди в Америці, чи в Європі, чи в Німеччині, ми до цього прийдемо. Тільки, тільки треба комусь це починати. Ми почали, на, втрачаємо багато енергії, зусиль. А стосовно нашого другого питання, ритму житті, що ми всі поспішаємо, пробки, ніколи поїсти, ніколи там, подумати про здоров'я, то ми зробили ще один такий новий продукт. Це сник нового покоління. Я не просто хочу рекламувати, я хочу сказати, що він, а чого він нового покоління? Да, тому що там та рецептура, яка задовільнить любого самого нами вогалівшого споживача. 
І це бренд Бранч. Багато з вас вже його знають, багато, і ми його вже багато продаємо, але це продукт, який дійсно не має аналогів на світовому ринку, і він родився в Україні. Тому ми будемо з вами зустрічати через рік, і через п'ять років, і ми побачимо, хто, прогнози де, позитивні. хто де знаходиться. Ага. Ну так, коротко. Тому ще раз, працювати, 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 і все буде добре. Не треба нічого думати, тому що життя йде, і треба дуже е, уважно від, від, е, дивитися на кожен день, кожен, е, кожну робочу неділю і не, не гаяти часу. І не паритись. Так, а Томаш, я щось не зрозуміла. Ти кушаєш е, растительне? І як? Не тільки, але теж, так. Да. Ну, подобається, так? Да? Так, да, да, вкусно, так. Да. А, ну, ну прекрасно взагалі. А Несле, кстати, тоже производит, да? Вот, вот, Несле. Но не в, не в Украине пока, да, поэтому... Next board, okay. Uh, you see, next board meeting, we are going to have already this, this meeting place. Excellent, wow. <laughs> Отлично, спасибо, uh, дякую. Uh, thank you so much. Let's, uh, let's uh, switch to energy. It was already mentioned that energy was one of the issues and which is uh, obviously impacting the future. Uh, of different producers and not only. Uh, so, Oleg, how the situation looks like in, uh, in gas sector and in energy in general? Well, funny enough, um, I will not advertise for gas. Uh, Everybody knows it. <laughs> but um, decarbonization leads to increase in demand for gas, actually. So everyone's buying Tesla he's putting some money into the pockets of those who produce gas. So to you? No, unfortunately. <laughs> we, don't <laughs> to we don't produce it, uh, not really. We don't produce it, we transport it. So we kind of, um, on the other side um, of, uh, yeah, of this battle. <laughs> <laughs> But um, just to, you know, briefly, as it says, you know, the reality check. Um, just wanted to give like few uh, major trends that actually transform energy sector. Well, um, and we should consider that Ukraine is becoming a part of global uh, energy market, uh, even though most people do not still do not believe it yeah um i hope um uh, and and obviously one of uh, my colleagues uh, janis kopach who's uh, here today with us uh, could probably verify a few theses that i will mention from european from european side <laughs> well we are um globalized actually. And the number one trend that defines uh, energy sector is the increasing demand for energy. Yeah. And actually, um, right after COVID restrictions were taken off or released, um, the demand increased significantly in Asia. And Asian markets, which are the biggest on the planet at the moment, actually pushed the prices for gas um, up this summer. On, um, in, in, in September, I think, there was a, like a general meeting, a big, big thing for everyone involved in energy. So that's a gas tech meeting. And um, the top executives of uh, oil and gas companies uh, like Chenier, Exxon, and these kind of companies, they pointed out pretty clearly that, guys, you should not expect low energy prices anymore. So, um, and just one month after, we saw gas prices rocketing in the sky. Yeah, so this is kind of check, you know, it did happen. Um, the other thing is, actually, um, when Ukrainian cluster started to compete for the resources, 
that added additional pressure on pricing of gas. But in Ukraine, we should, uh, in, in Europe, we should consider another trend that is um, significant. This is decarbonization, yeah? This stuff is real, and Ukraine will experience um, the um, outcome of uh, latest regulations imposed in the EU. I mean, every Ukrainian producer willing to export its products to the European Union will face the trans uh, border carbon taxes. So this will impact even countries outside of European Union. Uh, having this in mind, so this was additional pressure, as I said, on, on the pricing. And of course, um, having the, the crazy neighbor on, on, on the uh, north side, yeah, that puts additional, um, additional um, I would say, risks, real risks, for the whole European sector. So, um, not to mention, um, I should, I should mention actually the American sector as well, the American energy sector, which is second biggest in the world. So if Asian cluster is about probably some $50 trillion, the American cluster is $30 trillion, uh, European is, should be about 20 or so. So um, it's, it's quite different because at the, at the, at, in September, all of the cargoes heading from the United States, which is the biggest gas producer in the world, were heading east. Asian markets. Um, all of the cargoes from West Asia, I mean GCC countries, yeah, they were also heading to Asia. Now they're trying to reverse uh, this trend because politics is in place. And those cargoes arrive into Europe. So we should expect a modest you know, decline in, in gas prices in Europe when demand will drop within a month or two. And I, sh I would probably agree with Tomas for his forecast. So we should expect gas prices at some 500 euros or maybe some $500, I don't know. <laughs> um, if, we, if, we, if we get back to Ukraine, um, what's important for, for RGC as the uh, big midstream company operating in Ukraine? Um, actually, um, we didn't uh, suspend or cut any of our plans for this year. Um, over the last three years, we were um, investing in opening a new factory, new plant producing gas equipment. So this is like one a year. So we built three <laughs> until now. We have two factories in pipeline for this year to be built, assembled in Ukraine. Why we do that? Because we need to secure our supply chain. Because we experience a major problems and shortage and constraints when we get hit with the uh, COVID restrictions. And, hope, and this year, we will start export some of our equipment produced in Ukraine to EU countries. So, which is like a never happened before. <laughs> um, another thing to mention is we follow European trends and we invest in uh, research and development of uh, projects related to decarbonization. Uh, this year probably we will we will be in a position to connect to the grid first biomethane plant because gas cannot only be you know imported or produced or you know produced from the ground but it also can be produced from renewable uh, resources um, 
which are available in Ukraine. So we will get to see the first biomethane plant in Ukraine this year. That's my expectation. And not to mention also the project related to uh, synthetic gases, such as uh, hydrogen. Um, this is uh, something really new, but technologies are available. Um, we follow with our European colleagues um, on a research, and hopefully uh, this is like five, seven, se probably seven years perspective for the hydrogen to be available uh, widely. So European colleagues, they report they are uh, ready, like 90% 90, 90 ready to introduce hydrogen into the gas networks. Uh, Ukraine would probably be at the moment uh, 30 to 40% ready to introduce hydrogen to the network. So we should spend another year or two to define exactly what needs to be done and what the investment are required for that. Because the whole, uh, the whole um, infrastructure in Ukraine, not only gas, but electricity as well, is highly underinvested. Mm. So um, this is like in in few words. In a, and in just, and just, just to add a bit of a comment on uh, war. And, yeah, and how uh, resistant the energy system is. And how resistant is. energy sector is. I mean, uh, I ju it just happened to me, I was on a business trip uh, in the United States and I just got back and watching the uh, Ukrainian war on CNN is actually looks much worse than it is, there is no war. from Kiev. But there is, yeah, that's it, that's um, for sure. But there so is no I was, war. Yes, I was, I was really happy to, to be back to Kiev. Um, this is my comment on, on our attitude towards the war. Yeah, and, and I totally agree, we should keep our minds clear from uh, media scram. Yeah. So but the system is resistant, yeah, resistant enough in any kind of scenario, right? Well, um, <laughs> well, I, rem I, I remember 2014, and um, I would put it this way: um, gas will be the last resource uh, to disappear in case of, you know, siege and actual uh, actions of war. Mm -hmm. So you can rely on gas more than on any other resource available. Ah, that's good. Good to hear. <laughs> but hope that there will, be, there will be no war. This is actually our primary scenario. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Oleg. Now, I would like to ask also Sergei, uh, because you're also um, actually operating in the uh, energy sphere and you're producing technologies. Uh, what kind of future do you see this year in that sphere? What kind of uh, tasks and challenges your technologies would be able to resolve this year in the energy sphere? Я дякую, я перейду на українську мову, якщо можливо, так? Давайте. А, дякую. Стосовно, стосовно майбутнього цього року в, на ринку електроенергетики взагалі, тому що відновлювальна енергетика не є, є невід'ємною частиною вже зараз, а в майбутньому має стати основою для всієї електричної системи України як генерація. Це наша впевнена, це наше бачення. І, скажімо, ще в минулому році ми задалися для себе питанням, яка саме має бути електроенергічна система України на базі відновлюваних джерел. Ми це, так як в нас досить глибока експертиза стосовно саме електричної, ринку електричної енергії, не тільки відновлюваної, а взагалі, то ми змогли це для себе представити, і ми зрозуміли, яка майка ця енергосистема має бути в якійсь перспективі. Коли саме з генерації має бути тільки вітер, сонце, гідроенергетика, атом спочатку є, потім його немає через деякий час, ну і біоенергетика та 
можливо, геотермальна. А, і придумали, ми зрозуміли, як, як, яким, яка ця система має бути, і фактично сформували для себе бачення і сказав би таку дещо схожу на дорожню карту, і на, на, на базі цього сформували свою стратегію. А, з цього моменту стало все простіше. Тому що ми для себе розуміємо, що ми маємо робити, як це робити, і в нас є повна впевненість, що це не відворотньо. Тому що є дуже багато драйверів, які запевняють нас в тому, що ми праві. Десь приблизно таким чином, тому я вважаю, що на саме компаніям, які працюють в секторі відновлення енергетики, які розуміють замовника, які розуміють драйвери, розуміють тренди, вони не будуть мати великих проблем з реалізацією свого потенціалу. В той же час, да, якщо ми будемо дивитися на ті виклики, які є перед Україною, стосовно, наприклад, агресії Росії, можливої, так це може... Як це кажуть, це нас огорчить, але не встановить. Це добре. Ну, тобто ви продовжуєте в будь-якому випадку продовжуєте інвестувати, розвиватися і не зважаєте на ті, на ті зовнішні шуми. Так, ми, ну, скажімо, через те, що в Україні 20-21 рік були кризовими а, саме стосовно відновлювання енергетики, тому що... А, так, відновлена енергетика розвивалася за рахунок зеленого тарифу до 2020 року, потім почалися проблеми і фактично дуже багато проєктів, які були на стадії предевелопменту або вже девелопменту, вони були заморожені і вони зупинилися. Тому так як зараз є тренди на те, що відновлюва енергетика може працювати в ринкові без е, додаткових стимулів, е, то ми е, розуміємо, що за 20 цей рік треба, треба витратити, саме цей час треба витратити на е, формування девелоперських проєктів. І ми, так, ми плануємо в цьому році досить активно інвестувати в предевелоперські проєкти, Ну, на досить амбіційні гроші. Амбіційні це які? Ну, для нас це досить амбіційна цифра. Ми плануємо інвестувати в цьому році саме тільки в український, в український ринок біля 20 мільйонів доларів. Угу. Супер. Ну, так що запрошуємо до співпраці, я так розумію. Welcome. Дякую. Е, е, давайте перейдемо до... До кібербезпеки, до того, що всі наші попередні, ну майже всі попередні наші спікери відмічали як один із викликів. Ви є, Олександр, один із таких основних гравців в цій сфері. І от як вам здається, різні сектори готуються до викликів, які пов'язані з кібербезпекою? Які краще, які ще поки що не встигли? Ну тобто, як ви бачите взагалі оцю всю ситуацію, пов'язану з кібербезпекою? І якщо ви можете прокоментувати цей напрямок, Напад хакерського атаку на уряд, да, ну, нещодавно, то, будь ласка, якщо ні, я зрозумію. Хорошо. Да, действительно, мы, мы занимаемся кибербезопасностью, но кроме кибербезопасности в группу входят десяток почти компаний, которые строят IT на всех уровнях и заканчивая криптобезопасностью и кибербезопасностью. То есть, опять же, наш бизнес состоит из двух частей. Одна часть строит, вторая обслуживает полностью IT-системы. Даже есть предприятия или организации, где нет ни одного своего IT-шника и ни одного своего кибербезопасника. Все обслуживается нами на аутсорсе. Соответственно, мы имеем очень серьезные обязательства перед нашими клиентами и очень серьезно к этому относимся. Сегодняшняя ситуация для нас это как стандартная ситуация рисков, с которыми надо работать. То есть... Проанализировали, что нам надо сделать. Конечно, пришлось потрудиться. Мы сделали полностью, обновили резервную площадку айтишную, чтобы наша система работала. И вынуждены были во Львове развернуть, посчитав риски, киберцентр вторую площадку. Ну, чтобы можно было работать параллельно. На всякий случай. Да, на всякий случай. Как раз с понедельника начнется заполнение людьми именно уже этой площадки. 
так, чтобы мы отработали все. Понятно, как любому, напоминаю, человек, руководителю надо знать, что у него информационная система работает, дизеля заправлены, бесперебойники проверены и так далее, потому что ну, в эти бизнесе самое главное три составляющих. Это непрерывность работы, это безопасность и восстанавливаемость. То есть поэтому надо обязательно тоже потребовать, чтобы сделали хорошие копии бэкапов всех и сохранили их отдельно. То есть это... Потому что прежде чем, если руководитель не скажет, зачастую это не будет сделано, даже по процессам. Потому что процессы, вот как раз если событием 13-14 атаки на госсайты, там было все вроде нормально, все уязвимости были известны. Все об этом знали, но не было процесса контроля э, за выполнением, ну, за, за защитой, ну, ну, предупредительные меры не были сделаны, закрыты. То есть кто-то сделал, кто-то не сделал. Поэтому в безопасности, вот в кибербезопасности в частности, то есть все работает, если выполняются три вещи. Есть технологии, есть люди обучены и есть процессы. Вот сегодня процессы, именно процессов в государственных учреждениях нет от слова ну, изредка, очень редко. И получается так. Это потому что не дошли руки до того, чтобы процессы эти установить у Министерства цифровизации или нет? Например, в государственных предприятиях, если меняется руководитель раз в два года, меняется айтишник, кибербезопасник и так далее, и приходят новые то есть процессы при такой текучести невозможно построить. Есть государственный орган, который в принципе как-то следит и предупреждает достаточно неплохо о возможных уязвимостях, это ДСТЗ, но он не может контролировать исполнение своих указаний в тысячах разных предприятий. То есть должна быть в государстве третья система, которая, опять же, там же тоже люди меняются, руководство меняется. Третья система, которая следит за процессами и за методологией. То есть и имеет какую-то плетку, чтобы воздействовать. Это вопрос не ко мне, это вопрос к системе в государстве, но э, все потери были известны, то есть все уязвимости были известны, и все потери произошли там, где не выполнили рекомендации. Ничего нового не произошло. Еще одно могу сказать для руководителей. Поставьте себе галочку и проверьте, что сервисные организации, которые вас обслуживают и по IT, и по кибербезопасности, во-первых, хранят хорошо пароль от ваших систем и ваши контролируют тоже ну, их хранение. Потому что очередная, в основном э -э -э, заходили при взломе с учетными записями администраторов или делали все, что хотели. То есть понятно, от этого есть достаточно много систем защиты, в том числе там двухфакторная, трехфакторная авторизация и так далее, чтобы по второго ночи никто не зашел в вашу, в вашу систему и, и не, не резвился в ней. Но это уже тоже организационно. Потому что, э, как любая безопасность, кибербезопасность работает только если первое лицо выстроит все, то есть обеспечит технологии, обеспечит людей, обеспечит процессы. На отдельном уровне рассчитывать, что это сделает отдельный безопасник или отдельный айтишник, это... Ну, Нежелание заниматься этим, то есть это неправда, не будет работать. Ну а вы чувствуете, аппетит руководителей усиливается в последнее время это сделать или нет? И где как бы больше чувствуется? Да, практически каждый день я встречаюсь с коллегами, именно с владельцами, либо первыми лицами, которые мне задают вопросы, как выстроить у себя правильно. И я говорю, то есть на, чтобы, и я рассказываю именно человеку, который принимает решение, что надо сделать, Каких людей, то есть именно организационные меры. Потому что тех, техники купить просто. Людей, в принципе, набрать можно. Но процессы может поставить только первое лицо, и, при, при том, что он заинтересован в долгосрочной деятельности. Потому что, в принципе, э, кибербезопасность – это ответственность первого человека. Как э, и другой, как и пожарный, как и прочей безопасности и, и производственной. Ну, первый всегда за все отвечает. Ну, а, а, то есть ваш бизнес растет, я так понимаю, вообще безоговорочно. То есть у вас отличные перспективы на этот год или нет? Как ну, э, да. да. 
Вы уже это как прекрасно. Это хорошо. Спасибо. Да, коллеги, коллеги, it seems to me that we actually need to wrap up our conversation. It seems to me we have received a number of good insights and encouraging news and let's hope that the forecast will be fulfilling itself and actually next year at the next reality check we will be really seeing actually quite excellent results throughout this year. So let me wish everyone enthusiasm, very good health in mind, patience as well. <laughs> don't, um, don't read actually the news very carefully all the time and stay with the DBAs. Thank you so much and continue networking.